Today, June 27, is the optional memorial of Saint Cyril of Alexandria, Bishop and Doctor. What appears from a modern perspective to be theological hair-splitting and intellectual contortionism was, in the 4th and 5th centuries, the stuff of intense, erudite, and sometimes violent debate. Today's saint was of that heroic age when the church, just legalized, came bursting out of her cage like a lion. She had been locked up, roaming her cramped space, half starved and small muscled when, all of a sudden, the door was lifted and the world was hers. There followed two centuries of aggressive debate, sharp criticism, harsh reactions, rough counter-reactions, and prolific letter-writing until several church councils standardized the church's basic theology. Saint Cyril was a key actor in this theodrama. He was educated, irishable, strong-willed, politically astute, brilliant, and utterly convinced that his theology of Christ was correct. It was what mattered in the 5th century still matters today. Saint Cyril was the patriarch of Alexandria, Egypt from 412 to 444 AD, when it was a major city in the late Roman Empire. The patriarch of Constantinople was, as of 428, was a monk from Antioch named Nestorius. He taught that Saint Mary was the Christ-bearer, but not God-bearer. Nestorius is also associated with the related false teaching that there are two hypostatic unions in Jesus Christ, one divine and one human, a theory which locates two persons in the one body of Jesus. Various critics immediately identified the errors of Nestorius' teaching, but Cyril of Alexandria was the most tenacious in denouncing him. Cyril wrote to the Pope and demanded that the Patriarch of Constantinople either retract his false teachings or be excommunicated. A church council was called in Ephesus in 431 to settle the matter. The force for Cyril took total command of the council's proceedings and after numerous machinations as political as they were theological, the, the council declared Mary as the mother of God and Nestorius a heretic. With explicit papal support, Nestorius was removed from his see. Recriminations and counter-recriminations followed, damaging the reputation of all involved. Some regions of Syria followed Nestorius' teachings and separated from the church over the question of Christ's natures. Certain divisions remain even until today, but the teachings of the Council of Ephesus and the related Council of Chalcedon in 451 dogmatically refine the Church's Christology for posterity. Cyril and his followers saved the day. The theological issue at stake was theoretical, but not merely th theoretical. How could one person, Jesus of Nazareth, be both fully human and fully divine? Wouldn't the superior divine nature crowd out his human nature like light crowds out darkness? Some theologians before Cyril taught that the Logos, the second person of the Trinity, was a replacement for Jesus' human soul. This idea was condemned. Others, like Nestorius, claim that behind the mask of Jesus, a Logos and a human soul lurk side by side. This created problems too. Most obviously, when Jesus said, I thirst from the cross, was he speaking as God or man? 
What about when he said, Before Abraham was, I am? Who wept over the death of Lazarus? Who raised him from the dead? Who lifted up the chalice and spoke at the Last Supper? Who precisely was the eye of Jesus of Nazareth? The Christ a riddle needed to be solved. By the early 5th century, many had tried and failed. St. Cyril solved this perennial riddle by teaching that the subject just behind the eye of Jesus was one, not two. Jesus was a complex God-man of two natures, united in one person, and these two natures continually exchanged their respective theological and human attributes. Despite Cyril's theological accomplishments, the tensions inherent to understanding a God-man still perjure. There are images of a tan Jesus with sandy blonde hair and radiant white teeth tossing the frisbee. California Jesus, there is a stained glass of a crown Jesus on his throne, scepter in the hand, robed in majesty. Christ the King. And there is the wounded, naked, forlorn Jesus, hungry for air on the cross. The suffering servant Jesus. The church's theology places guard trails on the road to make sure we don't veer off into heresy. Yet much is still left to the realm of prayer, spirituality, and mystery. Saint Cyril placed those guardrails. Don't go beyond here. Be careful there. Stay on the well-trod path. One person, two natures, indivisible without confusion, perfect in Godhead, perfect in manhood, truly God, truly man, born of the Virgin Mother of God. Every heresy conquered is not a gravestone, but think of a huge theological cathedral of the church. Saint Cyril laid many of the bricks in the lower courses of our theological home. Let us pray. Saint Cyril of Alexandria assist and inspire all teachers, preachers, writers, and thinkers to follow your example of rigorous analysis of fidelity to churches, councils, of understanding the tradition not as an anchor, but as an, but as a dynamic force. Amen. Mm -hmm.